I remember the day I met Alex like it was yesterday. I was at this little dive cafe, minding my own business, sipping on the cheapest coffee they had, trying to make sense of my scattered thoughts and plans. That's when he walked in, like a scene straight out of a movie, except there were no dramatic lights or music, just the sound of the bell above the door and the smell of stale coffee mixed with his aftershave. Is this seat taken? He asked, pointing to the chair across from me with a smile that could knock you off your feet. Looks free to me. I replied, trying to sound cool and not at all flustered by his sudden appearance. We started talking, and damn, it was like we were cut from the same cloth. He was into all the junk I was, from binge-watching the same trashy series to arguing about the best pizza topping, it's pineapple, fight me. Fast forward a bit, and we're dating. Not just casual meetups, but the real deal. It felt like I'd known him my whole life, and before we knew it, we were talking about getting hitched. That's when the drama started. His parents, let me tell you, were something else. The first time I met them, it was like walking into a lion's den wearing a meat dress. They had this way of smiling while sizing you up, like they were deciding whether you were worth their time or not. So, you're the girl Alex can't stop yapping about, his mom said, her voice dripping with something that was definitely not warmth. Guilty as charged, I shot back, trying not to let her see she got to me. They laid down the law, pretty quick, telling us we needed to sign a prenup. Now, I ain't no gold digger, and I sure as hell don't need anyone's money, but that rubbed me the wrong way. I'll sign your prenup, I told them, but I've got one condition. If one of us cheats, the cheater pays up a hundred grand. Alex looked like I'd slapped him with a fish. Babe, I'd never cheat on you, he said, all wide-eyed and serious. Yeah, well, my ex said the same thing before I caught him with his pants down, literally. So, it's this or nothing. He agreed, and his parents did too, though they looked like they'd swallowed lemons. We thought that was the end of it, but boy, were we wrong. One evening, we were cuddled up on the couch, a tradition we had started since moving in together. We had this old, rickety couch that we swore we'd replace, but never did because, somehow, it had become our spot. The TV was on, but we weren't watching. We were too busy making plans for a trip to Italy we knew we couldn't afford, but were determined to make happen. Alex, think about it. The food, the wine, the art. We have to go. I said, my eyes sparkling with excitement. Alex laughed, wrapping his arm tighter around me. Emily, babe, you had me at food. But let's face it, our bank account is more camping in the backyard than romantic getaway to Venice. I playfully nudged him. So, we'll save. We'll cut back on. I don't know, things we don't need. Like your video games. He feigned horror. Not the video games. Take my shirts, my shoes, even my beloved coffee maker, but leave the games alone. We laughed, but that was us, always dreaming big, but grounded in the reality of our modest lives. We didn't care, we were happy. The happiness wasn't just in the big moments, it was in the little things, too. Like how Alex would make breakfast on Saturdays. He couldn't cook to save his life, but he'd somehow mastered the art of scrambled eggs and toast, which he'd serve with a side of his terrible coffee. I love those mornings. Hey, I'm thinking scrambled eggs today, what do you think? He'd ask, already heading to the kitchen. Only if you promise not to burn the toast this time, I'd call out, followed by. And I'm making the coffee. One day, the topic we had been avoiding came up. We were doing dishes together, a mundane task that somehow felt special because we were doing it together. Emily, we need to talk about, you know, starting a family, Alex said, breaking the comfortable silence. I paused, a plate in hand. I know. It's just. It's scary, isn't it? What if? What if we can't? Alex turned to me, drying his hands on a towel. Then we'll deal with it, together. But we won't know until we try, right? I mean, how hard can it be? I laughed, a mix of nerves and love. Famous last words, babe. But that's how it was with us. No matter what we were facing, we faced it together. 
Even when his mom started dropping not-so-subtle hints about grandchildren every chance she got, we took it in stride. Emily, darling, when are you going to give me some grandbabies? You're not getting any younger, you know. She'd say, her voice sweet, but the message anything but. I'd bite my tongue, smile, and say, We're working on it, aren't we, Alex? And he'd jump in, Yeah, mom, lay off, will you? These things take time. But as the year went on, the pressure started to build, not just from his mom, but from within. We wanted a family, but it wasn't happening as easily as we had hoped. Ever since Judy found her new hobby of making my life a living hell, our home turned into a battleground, and the main weapon was her sharp tongue. It wasn't just about the occasional jibe anymore, it was an all-out war, with daily assaults on my self-esteem and role as a wife. It all spiraled one Sunday lunch, a day that was supposed to be laid back and peaceful. Judy, with her uncanny timing, dropped by uninvited, just as we were about to sit down. The air was tense the moment she walked in, her eyes scanning the room like she was about to conduct a military inspection. Well, isn't this quaint? She started, her voice dripping with sarcasm as she looked at the modest spread I'd prepared. You really outdid yourself, Emily. I can see you've been slaving away in the kitchen all morning. Her eyes briefly met mine, a smirk playing at the corners of her mouth. Trying to keep the peace, I forced a smile. It's nothing fancy, Judy. Just something simple and quick. Please, have a seat. As we sat down, the barrage began in earnest. You know, Emily, Judy said, loading her voice with condescension. I was talking to Mrs. Henderson the other day, and she mentioned how her grandson was just born. It got me thinking, when are you and Alex going to give me some good news? It's not like you're getting any younger. I felt my cheeks burn, a mix of embarrassment and anger. I glanced at Alex, hoping for some support, but he was suddenly very interested in his plate. Mom, come on. Alex finally muttered, but it was half-hearted, and we all knew it. Judy plowed on, relentless. And Alex, dear, I don't mean to be cruel, but you're not a charity. You work hard for your money. Why waste it on Emily if she can't do her basic duties as a wife? A cleaning service and a cook would be much more efficient, don't you think? That's when I couldn't hold it back any longer. Judy, I am trying my best here. It's not like I don't want to have kids. And as for the house and my cooking, well, I didn't realize marriage was a service contract. Judy scoffed. Well, it's not a free ride either. You have responsibilities, Emily, which you're clearly not fulfilling. The room was heavy with tension, and I could feel the tears pricking at the back of my eyes. But what hurt the most wasn't Judy's words, it was Alex's silence. He finally spoke up, but it wasn't to defend me. Yeah, M, mom has a point. Maybe we should consider getting some help around here. Would make things easier for you, too. Easier for me? His words felt like a betrayal. It was clear I was on my own in this. Over the next few days, Judy's visits became more frequent, and with each visit, her criticism grew sharper. She'd inspect the house, pointing out every speck of dust or a pillow out of place. You call this clean? She'd scoff. My eyes must be deceiving me, because this looks like a pigsty. Then came the comments about my appearance. Is that what you're wearing? You know, a wife should dress to please her husband. It's no wonder Alex is always so tired, he has to come home to this. I tried to fight back. Judy, I don't dress for Alex, I dress for myself. And he's always so tired because he works hard, not because of what I wear. But it was like talking to a brick wall. Judy had made up her mind about me, and nothing I said or did would change it. Alex's stance, or lack thereof, was the biggest blow. Each night, after his mom's departure, we'd argue. Why won't you stand up for me, Alex? She's walking all over us, and you're just letting her. Emily, she's old, set in her ways. What do you want me to do, kick my own mom out? No, but I want you to be my husband, to stand by me, not her. 
It was clear this was more than just about Judy's disapproval. It was about us, our marriage, and whether we were strong enough to stand together or let Judy's criticisms tear us apart. As the days turned into weeks, I realized that this wasn't just a phase. It was a full-blown siege, and if we didn't do something soon, there might not be anything left to save. Things between me and Alex had been icy since Judy ramped up her campaign of critique. But it wasn't just the home front that was feeling the strain. Alex himself had started acting weird, and not in a he's just stressed at work kind of way. It was something else, something that made my stomach twist in knots. It started with the phone calls. Alex had always been pretty open about his phone, we didn't keep secrets from each other. But then, he started stepping out of the room every time he got a call. And it was always the same caller ID, John Work. Who's John Work? I asked one evening, trying to keep my voice casual. Alex flinched, a telltale sign that he was on edge. Oh, just a new guy at the office. Lots of questions, you know? But it didn't stop there. Alex, who was as far from a fashionista as you could get, suddenly started caring about his appearance. Gone were the days of graphic tees and worn-out jeans. Now, it was all crisp shirts and slacks. And cologne, he was using cologne now. Since when did he care about smelling like a department store? What's with the new look, Alex? Got a job interview or something? I joked one morning, watching him comb his hair in a way I'd never seen before. He just smirked, a little too quickly. Just felt like changing things up. No harm in that, right? And the late nights at work, they were becoming a regular thing. Another long one, babe? I'd text, trying not to sound too needy. Sorry, M. This project is killing me. Won't be late, I promise. He'd text back, but the clock would tick well past midnight before I heard his keys in the door. I tried to shake the feeling that something was off, but it clung to me like a shadow. That's when I decided to hire a private detective. It felt like something out of a bad TV show, but I had to know for sure. The evidence came in a plain brown envelope, the contents as damning as they were heartbreaking. Photos of Alex with another woman, their intimacy undeniable, captured in frozen moments, that shattered our years together. But it was the recording that cut the deepest. Their conversations, filled with endearments and plans, left no room for doubt. They were in love, or at least, he was with her. I sat there, the evidence spread out in front of me, a cold realization settling in. This was it, this was the proof that could anchor me in a stormy divorce, should it come to that. Photos that caught moments stolen from our life together, and words that betrayed every I love you he had ever whispered in my ear. But I kept it all a secret, a painful burden I chose to carry alone. I wasn't ready to confront him, not yet. I needed a plan, a way to navigate the wreckage of our marriage with my dignity intact. The following days were a blur. Alex continued his charade, and I played along, the perfect wife with a smile plastered on my face and a heart breaking silently. Our conversations became a dance around the truth, each word measured, every laugh forced. Everything okay, M? You've been quiet, Alex would ask, his concern seemingly genuine. Yeah, just tired, you know? Work's been crazy, I'd reply, the lie tasting bitter on my tongue. It was just another mundane day, or so I thought, until I stumbled upon a conversation that would change everything. There I was, passing by the slightly ajar door to Alex's office, when their voices caught my attention. It was Alex and his mother, Judy, and they weren't just chit-chatting. The tone was serious, heavy with intent. I'm telling you, Mom, I can't do this anymore. It's not just about the kids, I've lost all feeling for Emily. It's like we're roommates, not husband and wife. Alex's voice, strained and tired, floated through the gap. Judy's voice, ever so sharp, replied, Well, of course, you feel that way. She's not given you a child, and let's be honest, what else has she brought to this marriage? But let's not be hasty. My 70th birthday is coming up, and we wouldn't want to miss out on a generous gift from her, now would we? 
The cynicism in her voice was like a knife twisting in my gut. They were plotting against me, using me until they deemed it convenient to throw me aside. And after we get a nice, expensive gift, we can kick her to the curb, right? Alex said, his voice cold and calculating. Exactly, dear. Just bide your time a little longer. Judy confirmed, her voice dripping with malice. I stood there, rooted to the spot, a mix of shock and anger boiling inside me. They were planning my exit from this family as casually as one would plan a grocery list. The hurt was deep, but it sparked something else in me, a burning desire for revenge. They thought they could use me, discard me at their convenience? I'd show them I wasn't just some pawn in their twisted game. A few days later, during a family dinner that felt more like a farce than a meal, Judy brought up her upcoming birthday. With the same smirk that I had come to despise, she leaned in and asked. So, Emily, dear, what are you planning for my birthday? Something special, I hope. I met her gaze, my face a mask of calm. Actually, Judy, I was thinking of throwing you a dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant. A night you won't forget. Her eyes lit up with greed, and she exchanged a quick, satisfied look with Alex. They thought they had me cornered, but little did they know, I was already two steps ahead. Oh, Emily, that sounds delightful. Just close family, you know. Keep it intimate, Judy said, her voice oozing fake sweetness. Of course, Judy. It'll be our pleasure, I replied, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. The weeks leading up to Judy's 70th birthday felt like a slow march towards D-Day. Every smirk from her, every indifferent shrug from Alex, fueled my resolve. The plan was simple yet bold, just like the movies, host a lavish dinner at the city's most luxurious restaurant under the guise of a loving gesture, then drop the bombshell. But, like any good plot, the devil was in the details. The night before the party, the tension at home was palpable. Alex, oblivious to the storm brewing, was casually lounging on the couch, scrolling through his phone. Everything set for tomorrow? He asked, not looking up. Oh, you could say that, I replied, my tone light, belying the turmoil inside. The day arrived, and as guests started to fill the opulent dining room reserved for Judy's celebration, the air was thick with anticipation. My heart raced, not from nerves, but from the adrenaline of what was about to unfold. Judy, ever the queen bee, basked in the attention, lavishing in the luxury of her surroundings. Oh, Emily, you've outdone yourself. This place is exquisite, she exclaimed, her voice loud enough for nearby tables to hear. As we all settled in, the meal proceeded with the kind of forced merriment that comes with such family gatherings. Laughs were shared, stories exchanged, and then, as the dessert plates were cleared away, the waiter approached with the final act of the evening, the bill. He leaned in, discreetly informing us the dinner cost was $3,000. Without missing a beat, I handed over my card, the gesture unnoticed by most. It was then Alex, with a smirk that didn't reach his eyes, decided to drop his bombshell. Emily, I think it's time everyone knew. I'm tired of this, of us. I want a divorce. The words hung in the air, a toxic cloud that seemed to suffocate all other noise in the room. Before I could even process the full weight of his statement, Judy piped up, her voice sharp and unforgiving. Well, then. Since that's out in the open, I think it's best you leave, Emily. We're celebrating family tonight, and well, you're no longer part of it. The room went deadly silent. Every eye was on me, waiting to see how I'd crumble. But I didn't. With a calm I didn't feel, I stood, nodded, and walked out without a word. The cool night air hit me like a slap as I made my way home, the finality of everything that had happened washing over me in waves. By the time I reached our, no, his apartment, a plan formed. I packed my essentials, the numbness giving way to a cold resolve. This was it. The end of one life and the start of another. As I zipped the last suitcase, my phone started buzzing, a relentless, insistent vibration that I initially ignored. Curiosity, however, got the better of me. Judy's voice screeched from the other end. 
Emily. The payment didn't go through. You need to fix this now. The sweet, sweet irony. In my preparations for the inevitable, I had secured my exit strategy. I had blocked the shared account, knowing it would be the first thing Alex would try to use against me. Oh, Judy, that's unfortunate. But since I'm no longer part of the family, as you so eloquently put it, I'm afraid you'll have to sort this out yourselves. Her outrage was palpable, even through the phone, but it was music to my ears. The chaos that unfolded was a fitting end to the farce my marriage had become. Reports came through the grapevine of the restaurant staff demanding payment, of Judy's escalating tantrums, and eventually, the arrival of the police to calm the storm she had become. In the end, it was Alex and his relatives who had to pull together the money to settle the bill, a poetic justice for the betrayal and humiliation they had subjected me to. The morning after the dinner disaster felt like waking up to the aftermath of a storm. I had my plan, my resolve, and a set of divorce papers in my hand as I made my way back to what used to be our shared home for the last time. The moment I stepped through the door, the air crackled with tension, thick enough to cut with a knife. Alex and Judy were there, looking like they'd been arguing. The sight of me seemed to unite them in hostility. You've got some nerve showing up here after last night, Alex spat out, his face a mix of anger and disbelief. Judy, ever the viper, was quick to add her poison. Ungrateful wretch. You've embarrassed us in front of the whole city. Do you know how humiliating it was to have the police calm me down? People were laughing, filming. I met their fury with a calm I didn't feel. Embarrassed? You think that's your biggest problem right now? I tossed the divorce papers on the table, the photos of Alex's infidelity on top. You should be more concerned with this. The color drained from Alex's face as he picked up the photos, his mother peering over his shoulder. Their outrage turned to shock, then to panic as they realized the extent of what I had. And let's not forget the prenup, shall we? I continued, my voice steady. You cheat, you pay, $100,000, to be exact. Judy's face twisted into a snarl. You wouldn't dare. You can't do this to us. Oh, but I can. And I will. My tone was cold, final. Alex, the reality of the situation finally dawning on him, switched tactics. M, please. Let's talk about this. We can fix it. I couldn't help but laugh, bitter and hard. Fix it? You think you can just undo everything with a few words? No, Alex. It's done. Judy, ever the manipulator, tried a softer approach, her voice dripping with faux concern. Emily, darling, think about what you're doing. This will ruin us. That ship has sailed, Judy. You should have thought about that before. The begging turned to pleading, their words a desperate scramble to salvage what they could. But my mind was made up. I was done being the victim, done with their lies and manipulations. In the end, Alex had no choice but to borrow the money from his parents to pay me. As I left that house for the last time, check in hand, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. After everything went down, I used the payout from Alex to put a down payment on a small but cozy place of my own. It's funny, you know, how much peace you can find in the walls of a place that's just yours, where every nook feels like a sanctuary from the chaos of the past. Life's quieter now and I like it that way. I've got a job that keeps me busy, neighbors who nod and smile, and a little garden that's all mine to tend to. But every once in a while, the grapevine tosses a juicy bit my way about Alex and Judy. Just the other day, I was grabbing coffee from the corner spot where locals hang, and I bumped into someone from the old neighborhood. After the usual pleasantries, they leaned in, voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. Hey, have you heard about the latest drama with your ex and his mom? They asked, eyes gleaming with the thrill of gossip. I couldn't help but raise an eyebrow, a mix of curiosity and detachment taking hold. Can't say that I have. Do tell. Well, they started, clearly savoring the moment. It seems Judy's not too pleased with Alex's new girlfriend. Word is, they've been at it like cats and dogs. Makes your situation look like a walk in the park. 
The conversation moved on, but as I walked away, coffee in hand, I couldn't shake the feeling of utter relief. There was a time when news like that would have sent me spiraling, but now? Now it was just another piece of someone else's story. These days, my biggest concern is whether my tomatoes will ripen before the squirrels get to them or if I'll ever get the hang of yoga without looking like a newborn deer on ice. Life's simpler, quieter, and infinitely sweeter on this side of chaos.